Welcome to the Assurology Show, a growth hacker's guide to human capital management with your host, Mike Vinoy. Each week, we bring you experts in human resources, employment law, accounting, benefits planning, and more to build productive organizations. You'll gain practical guidance for your business. You'll be alerted to the latest news and mega trends that impact small and mid-sized companies. We'll give you the hands-on information you need to stay compliant with ever-changing employment laws, the strategies you need to win the war for talent, and much more. So you can focus on what you do best, growing your business. Enjoy the show. Five must-know HR changes that just happened in 2022. Uh, there's so much changing in the world of HR and compliance. Uh, we talk all the time on this show about how what used to be a handful of big federal laws have become state laws, have become local laws, and all these states and local municipalities are adopting their own versions of these federal laws. The, the, it, it's getting exponentially more complex. And there's a few really big ones that have just happened in the last year that a lot of employers just don't know about and they've got to get ahead of it if they're going to stay compliant. So a perfect guest for me today. If you guys are regular watchers of the show, you know Mary. Uh, Mary Simmons, she's our Vice President of HR Consulting at Assure. Uh, she's a SHRM certified professional. Also for the past eight years, Mary has been an adjunct professor at New York Institute of Technology. Uh, prior to Assure, Mary was the director of HR consulting for a 55-year-old HR consulting firm in New York. Uh, Mary, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Mike. Glad to be here. So we're going to, I think we're going to spread this conversation probably a, a, across a, a few shows because there, there's so much to, to unpack here. It's uh, a lot. I, I think I want to start out <laughs> with just uh, the biggies for 2022. I think we're going to follow up with there's a whole bunch more for 2023 that employers really need to understand. Uh, but but some stuff is already rear, rear view mirror. C can you kind of help us understand what, what are the biggies? I, I think maybe uh, uh, I want to start with tra uh, pay transparency. This is an area where some stop, the states have made it law uh, and the laws aren't all the same. But some states have made transparency law, but clearly this is a mega trend uh, that that is that is going to see its way into more state legislatures. So c c help us, I guess, maybe first understand the pay transparency movement, and then what are some of the the, the regulatory updates that have that are that are now part of the law? Yeah. So and I and I also think that it's important for employers to understand where these laws are coming from. Um, and it really comes from your pay equity laws, right? So we want to encourage employers to pay uh, employees equally based on their experience, not based on any other um, parameters such as something that may cause a discrimination claim, right? So you don't wanna pay women lower than men. Um, and statistics will tell you that uh, women make considerably less than men. So pay transparency is one of those laws that is um, trying to help employers um, have pay equity within their organizations. So <clears throat> I see this on the rise. And listen, Mike, I, I give this presentation every single year because it is so important to go over what went on in the year before, because a lot of the regulatory <clears throat> agencies will push things through at the end of the year or the yeah. beginning of the year. Maybe they think people aren't paying attention. Maybe that's the best time to get it through the courts. I don't know, um, but pay transparency is definitely on the rise. What it is simply stated, and as you said, it is different in each state, and there's a couple municipalities um, that do it a little bit differently than their state. And if you remember from prior presentations that we gave, whatever the law is where the employee sits, where they do their work, they get the better of the law. So if the municipality has a better law that favors the employee more than their state law or the federal law, 
the employee gets that where they sit, that law, right? So yeah. it is really makes it difficult for employers. Um, and that's why, you know, we send weekly updates on this stuff. And I can tell you, we've had to send bi-weekly updates at the end of the year because there's so much. Pay transparency really says that employers need to be transparent on the salaries that they are offering for an open position when they post the ad. And let me just... <laughs> you know, explain that a little bit further. Most yeah. of these laws, Mike, will tell employers that internally they have to post this as well. Do you see yeah. any issues there with yeah, me posting? Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so this is, this is the thing that's getting people in so much trouble. And, and, and I love, I, I'm glad you started where you did because this is born of pay equality laws. Like, it, like it's it's been illegal to pay, you know, a, a, a woman less than a man to do the same job in the same circumstances, right? And so these right. laws are emerging as a way to kind of force the hand, create the transparencies, shine the spotlight on issues to, to make sure that, like, if there is a discrepancy in pay, that there are good, valid legal reasons for it. It's not based on the things that are illegal to discriminate, you know, age, gender, looks, whatever. It's, it's based solely on job qualification. Absolutely. And so look, we're, we're right now in, um, you know, a difficult situation recruiting people. I will tell you that you will get when, when we do recruitment strategy with our clients and I'm helping you write an ad, I will tell you, you get at least 50% more responses when you post the salary. Okay. But I think, you know, when you post the salary, if I post 100000 to 200000 for a position, the person applying automatically thinks they're going to get 200000 So if you offer one fifty because they don't have the top range of the experience, you may not get that person to accept the position. Um, yeah. So you really, the employers, when I'm writing ads with them now, we're really digging in. We're really taking a step back and maybe doing um, some salary surveys, some benchmarking, some salary grading for the position. So we know entry level marketing position gets paid this. You know, the next level has this many years experience and they get paid this. Employers really should have had this um, in their in the past, but they have to have it going forward. Um, Colorado, I would say, is in effect now, uh, in was in effect in 2022. And in my eyes, I really see it as, as the most restrictive. Maybe that's not the, the best word, but it has the most parameters around their pay transparency because it also includes promotional opportunities. So let's just say um, and I had this exact example in an employer. The employer had a promotion um, opportunity. Of course, they looked internally first. They chose one individual over another individual. The other individual who did not get the position heard about it and said, well, you didn't even allow me. I didn't know it was open. You didn't you didn't advertise that promotion. And yeah. oh, by the way, because it's a promotional opportunity, you also have to tell us what the pay transparency is. And I say this to my employers all the time. I say, let me take care of the compliance. You take care of running your business because your employees know more than you do half of the time, right? Yeah. And so, you know, even though these are very new laws, um, you really need to get on board with them. Um, number one, it, it's it's the right thing to do. And I think in the end, it does help your organization. Um, but I think the other reason is because you don't want somebody triggering a lawsuit, right? Saving right. you time and money is is what we what compliance HR compliance one hundred and one right. It, it's really the most important thing. I think that that's going to be a big thing. I, I was at dinner uh, a few weeks ago with the CEO of a, of a 
small, medium-sized software company, tech company. Uh, he's out of California. Um, and he's having a terrible time complying with this. Good, good guy. Uh, he was not intentionally having pay disparities for people based on, you know, nefarious reasons. Uh, but there, uh, as he's posting jobs, he's having to rethink how he is uh, creating job bans and salary bans and comp bans and publishing all this to create the transparency because as he's bringing people on, in a, you know, he, he might have somebody who's paying X and maybe there's a policy that well, we, when we promote someone, we don't give them more than a 10 or 15% raise, which maybe has seemed reasonable to that person for a very long time. But all of a sudden you're bringing someone new in and you got to pay them up here and, and you create all these, you know, bad feelings and well, in, 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 in equity issues. Yeah. So we're in he's an inflationary go- period. So yeah, it would it would stand to reason that your salaries would go up. But what employers need to think about when you have to adhere to these pay transparency laws is you got to fix your house before you go forward. Right. right. Um, and we always say that. Right. You got to shore up your house. You know, um, when these laws come out, look back before you look forward. But you definitely have to look forward. So in 2022, Colorado, New York City, Jersey City, Ithaca, New York. That was that was kind of a surprising one in, in Westchester County. So um, Ithaca, New York and Westchester, both in New York State. But as of December 21st, all of New York State got signed into law. So it will be all of New York, all of Colorado, and then, you know, California and Washington start started January 1st of this year. And again, each state is just a little bit different. So when we're working with our employers, and of course we have employers in every one of these states and multitude of different industries, we're working with them to figure out what's the range that you're going to give. And there's not a ton of parameters on the ranges, um, but I will tell you, you know, some of these nuances, boy, they'll get you because in Washington state, you also have to put the benefits and, you know, I, if I'm writing an ad with an employer, I'm, of course, telling them you got to use your your benefits in the ad because you, that's the way you attract new employees. Right. Um, benefits yeah. are probably neck and neck with salaries these days because we know how expensive medical is. And another yeah. part of benefits, you you know, that I would add not inclusive of this law, but is your time off. But. You, this is a difficult law to adhere to. Um, and, you know, we're we're really finding, you know, employers are having a hard time with this. Um, but there yeah. is a way forward. Right. So we certainly are helping employers with this. You know, fun fact, the states that have this pay transparency, Mike, um, law right now, as of 2023, all the states that I named represent about 22 percent of the yeah. current workforce. Yeah. So yeah. that's a lot. And, you know, here's the challenging thing for for companies that are posting remote positions. What do you do? Let's say the position can work anywhere. And that includes I'm, I might be sitting in. Chicago, Illinois, my company, but I'm hiring a remote position and the person can work in New York, Colorado, Washington, or, or California. What do you do on that ad? You should put what? the pay transparency. You should yeah, I, that. I was going to say, what do you do? You, do you, so you, <laughs> unless you explicitly, question. yeah, unless you explicitly list that these are the eligible states to work in, you you have to put, you have to list it. Is that accurate? Yeah. 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 And you can't do that. You can't, you, you, you would have to have an employment reason, right? So anything, anytime we say, you know, we won't hire this or we will hire this group of individuals, it has to be directly related to the position. So how are you going to justify that? Because I didn't want to give pay transparency. I'm pretty sure that's not going to pass muster with these states. 
now you're discriminating against these states. <laughs> you, you, I do not advise that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's tricky. It's it's really really tricky. And I would say that in in 2023 we expect Connecticut, Maryland, Nevada, Rhode Island, and New Jersey. Uh, Jersey City, of course, is in Jersey. Um, to also add this. And, you know, it's, you know, it's going to look a little bit different for each of these states, but I think that every employer should look to this. Again, my advice, I always put, or, or very often I will put a salary range. And the reason for that is because you get at least a 50% more, resp uh, better response rate on your ad. Um, yeah. Can it cause internal issues if you have not watched your house and kept your internal team up with what you're offering um, people from the outside? Yeah, it can. Yeah. Um, so but that can be let, fixed too. Let, t t tell me if this is a fair recap. It'll, it'll, I'll try to be as brief as I can. Um, we're, we're not advocating for or against. This is we're just communicating the law, right? And this is we're giving the, our, our best counsel as a result. So we, we acknowledge. And we talk all the time about how the there's a sea change where the laws are increasingly being uh, protecting the rights in, in, in uh, of employees and making it harder for employers. So we acknowledge that this is a burden for employers. Is is so frequent the case uh, to to better comply with law and to avoid the risk of lawsuit in in, in uh, 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 you know, legislative bodies coming in in, in, in fines for, for not being compliant. Um, almost always the best case is great HR practices further upstream. So if you don't have salary bans, if you don't have job descriptions and you have Joe is great at this, Sue's great at this, and I pay these people and, and maybe it's come from the bottom of my heart and maybe it's worked for me. Uh, and I'm not trying to screw over anybody, but now all of a sudden I don't have any of these best HR best practices in place. Now all of a sudden I have to comply with this uh, uh, pay transparency law. I might hate it, and because it makes it so hard because I'm blowing up my internal. Well, the best way to make that a non-issue is to have these great HR practices in place in the first place. If everybody had job descriptions. If every job had a salary band, if these things were public knowledge and when you went through your performance reviews, you say, okay, Mary, uh, the, the, the low in high end of this job pays X and Y, and you're sitting right here. Therefore, if you're having these types of HR conversations all along, complying with this law doesn't crush you, right? And, and so right. I would say an acknowledgement, this is gonna be really hard for a lot of especially smaller employers. But yeah. what it's probably going to do is going to force everyone's hand to implement the right HR best practices further upstream, which does nothing but create a, a happier, more productive workplace in the first place. Right. It, it, and I, I think it makes it I think it's going to make it easier to hire. Um, and the fact of the matter is your employees probably already know what each yeah. other makes. Right. It's yeah, it's against the law. It's concerted protected activity for employees to be able to discuss salary. So you can't prohibit them from talking about salary. So they right. are, <laughs> right? right? Um, and that's okay, that's, that's the way of the world. And so they probably already know what each other makes. You, you might as well make it equitable and, and it is difficult, um, but we've helped many employers through it who in the beginning are ripping their hair out and going, Mary, I can't do this. And we're, by the end of it, they're like, okay, this makes sense. This I can do, right? And and yeah. you just got to get, you know, your house in order. Like I said, it can be done. Um, well, and, like and I, I said, like what there's you, a way forward. I, you're 100% right. But your employees are talking about this anyway, but do you right. want the conversation to happen in the shadows or do you want to happen no. in, the, in, in, in the light of day where you can help participate in the conversation, right? If I, if, if somebody says, hey, that person's making X and I'm only making Y, that's not fair, but it's happening at the water cooler, there's, there's going to be bad feelings. But if it's part of your performance management process and say, okay, 
here's the low point for the job, midpoint for the job. Here's here's where you're at. Here's where you're at relative to your peers in the range. And here's your job performance. And this is why I'm paying you this. It's like, oh, it, it might be a rough conversation, but there's all the mystery is taken out of it. And when people don't Correct. know the full story, they tend to fill in the blanks with their own version. It's usually worse than the version that you want would have told, which is the, the real reasons why, right? Anything else you want to put a bow on this topic about pay transparency? Um, I, I would just say that, you know, I would now, whether you're in these states or not, look at the salaries that you're offering, do a pay equity um, audit, uh, which we yeah. do for employers all the time. Lots yeah. of things that you should be looking at, classifications, meeting the salary minimum, meeting minimum wage, which I think all employers know about, mm. uh, and then that the pay equity and see if you have disparities now and fix those, right? So many of our employers are getting ERTC money. That money is there to invest back into your organization through better HR function, through helping your employees, through pay equity and and compensation to your employees. So, yeah. so if you haven't gotten your ERTC money, you know, call us, but if you have, that's what that money should be used for. So uh, th there's a lot of detail around the specific st states. Um, we're we're going to include show notes. So if you're watching this on our website, uh, you, you, we'll, we'll provide a, a, a blog post with these details. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, go down to the comment section. We'll have a link with show notes uh, that has, has the details. There's a, there's a lot to know state by state. So we'll list the specific states that have passed that legislation so that you don't have to do the homework. But uh, I think punchline here, uh, a handful of states that represent a quarter of the U.S. workforce already have laws on the books and uh, things are just going to accelerate in this category. Thing. You know, we're, we, the, the country's not moving back away from this, uh, re regardless of who's in the White House. This, this, is, this is the movement that's happening. All right, let's move to our next one, uh, Mary. So there's been a bunch of changes in leave laws. So different leave types. Uh, yep. What is it that employers need to understand about the, these uh, leave law updates? So the first thing you have to understand what the new leave is in your particular state, right? And you also need to understand where it applies to your remote employees. So I was just <clears> on the phone with an employer yesterday and they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have employees in almost every state, but but they only work, you know, three to six months. So I don't think any of those leave laws apply to my employees. I'm like, mm, yeah, they do. <laughs> you know, so, you know, these leave laws, um, that's the first thing, right, is to understand the the particular leave. The other thing is many of these states will have more than one leave law. So they will have a paid family leave, they will have a sick leave, and then if that employer is over 50 employees, well then you've got uh, you know, the federal leave law, which is FMLA. So how do those leaves interact with each other? Where are they um, concurrent? And where are, can they be stacked by the employee? And I will tell you, Mike, every state is just a little bit different. So yeah. it is very hard for an employer to say, oh, well, I'm in all these states. Um, you know, I'm just going to give everybody, you know, all this time off and, and, I'll, and I'll satisfy those, those laws. These have to be specifically written in the handbook. I'll, I'll give you a quick example. Yeah, please. So New York has a sick leave law, as many states do, and, and we'll go over that. Many states have, have sick leave laws where they mandate based on how many employees you have, how much sick leave an employee gets. I had an employer in New York give me their handbook. They're like, oh, I'm, I'm sure my handbook is perfect. And I'm like, oh, do, do you have the sick leave in there? And I named a couple other, you know, leaves that policies I knew New York had to have. And they go, oh, yeah, 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 I have it. But when I look at the sick leave, it says 
you know, you can take sick leave if you're sick. That's not the law, right? So the law will have different stipulations. The, the, it says it's sick or safe leave, <laughs> actually. Mm. And what does safe mean? That means human traffic, if you're a victim of human trafficking. And, and mm. if you really look at the law, Mike, I will tell employers, you give those sick days because in, you shouldn't be asking why they're taking it because there's certain uh, privacy around some of the reasons that they would be taking it, like domestic violence, right? So, right. you know, when it comes to these laws, they have to be written very specifically by an expert in your handbook. There is not one of these laws do, that does not uh, mandate a posting requirement a physical policy, which means your handbook, right? Or you could give it to them physically, but makes more sense to have one document, have them sign it, make sure you have documentation that they saw this leave. Yeah. So that's what I wanna start with, not to give anybody, you know, um, anything to worry about, right? Um, because, the, you know, this again is something that, um, we do for a living and happy to help. Um, there's 11 states plus DC that now have paid family leave. Now in 2023, Oregon, Colorado, and Maryland will go into effect. I believe there will probably be uh, at least 11 more states that will be added next year. They're, they're in the works, right? Um, so this and, and, and everybody should hear the the words correctly. These are uh, so there's 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 always been there's a, there's this change going with leave laws. And so if we think back to the '90s, early '90s, a Family Medical Leave Act (FMLA) that basically protects you can go for all the justifiable reasons and you and you don't lose your job, but it's not paid. FMLA is not paid leave. These new laws are right. paid leave. So you as an employer, Correct. you're going to, if, if you fall into the criteria of these laws and they're all different, that you have to pay these people. So regardless if you have a sick, sick leave, a PTO policy, uh, paid time off, any of that, you, you're, you're getting one if you live in one of these states and you, and you have to, have to know it. Right. Yes, the pivotal word there is paid, yeah. uh, family and medical leave. And again, there's different nuances. So that I think is one of the biggest changes. Um, you know, I will mention that, you know, the federal government also has had in and out of the courts a federal paid leave. Um, and it, it hasn't passed and it's, it's not close right now, but I kind of smell that that might be something that, that comes down the road. Um, and listen, these are, these are good, you know, leaves for the employees, right? Um, it, I think it's, it's a, it's a positive thing. And I th would think most employers have some type of vacation, personal day, sick day anyway, um, so you're just weaving this into what you have, but again, the verbiage that you have in your policy is critical because I have had employers who had this leave, you know, New York's had it for three years, um, audited on this. So you have to be very specific in the way, you know, you have to follow what the state requirements are. Yeah. Um, so that's paid leave, family and medical leave. So in addition to the paid family and medical leave, there are also 15 states. And in addition to those states, there's many municipalities that have paid sick leave. So already your head should be spinning a little bit because when do they take paid family and medical leave? And when do they take paid sick leave? And again, when are they concurrent? and when can the employee stack them? And this is the other thing that we really customize in a handbook. I'm assuming that most employers 
where they're allowed to not make these leaves stackable, right? Meaning you take one and then you take the other. And oh, by the way, then you can take vacation. <laughs> that you, we put some verbiage in there to protect you from the employee being out the entire year. Yeah. Um, so yeah. this, you know, is why those handbooks take a long time and why we stress a customized handbook versus, you know, nothing yeah. upsets me more. You know, I was talking to another employer the other day and I said, oh, so, so tell me about your handbook. And it was a really nice family run business. Um, really, really smart, you know, entrepreneurs, they, you know, just really, um, successful and great, but you know, they realized they needed help on the HR side and they were like, well, my grandmother helped me smart lady with the handbook. And I said, Oh, how did you get the information? I Googled it. Yeah. Nothing makes me twitch more Mike, as you know, yeah. as when I hear that, because I just, it's no, don't do that, please. Yeah. <laughs> First of I mean, all, you can't Google what you don't know to Google, right? You don't know what that, you don't I mean, know. I'm not going to be anti-Google. It's a, it's it's great. I mean, research gets smarter, but you hit, yes, you hit the nail. On the, I mean, I, I had a bellyache a, a year ago, and it and it, it took me and Google realized I was dying of cancer uh, in about 15 <laughs> minutes, right? I mean, I'm not a doctor, <laughs> but I don't know the questions to ask, right? So <laughs> Google's great, but don't you don't know the questions to ask. You don't know the sources to go to. You don't know the tricks that these websites play to rank above each other. You have to know the authoritative sources to be able to put this stuff together. Right. And, you know, it's, it, you know, so there's two issues with that. One is just cutting and pasting a paid sick leave and plopping it into your handbook. The other is looking at it and going, oh, well, I'm just going to change one or two words. Those one or two words could make that, you know, you know, illegal, right? And a, a, a litigation trigger um, for yeah. an employee. So you have to be really, really careful. Um, now, Maine and Nevada, you know, again, surprising states, right? We always think New York and California um, have pretty restrictive laws, but Maine and Nevada allow time off for any reason, not just sick leave. And again, many of those states and municipalities that I mentioned prior that have the paid sick leave, like New York, um, like Connecticut, have paid sick safe leave. <coughs> um, but when you dig into those laws, it is for almost any reason. And let me say almost with air quotes, right? Uh, that needs a, a bigger explanation that I'd have to customize for an employer. And then there's a couple more leave, uh, leave laws, right? So San Francisco now has a leave for larger employers um, for employees during a public health emergency. Hmm. Um, and maybe that's for their, for their um, earthquakes. I'm, I'm not sure where that came from. Colorado also has a similar leave. Um, New York has something similar as well. Um, for individuals who are emergency responders. Um, and that probably comes uh, out of 9-11, I'm going to guess. Um, Oregon allows use of paid sick leave for the care of a child due to illness or school closure. So I hope you get the trend here, Mike. Yeah. There's a lot of leaves. They are very specific to not only the state, but to a municipality. Um California um, has something new for two, at the end of 2022, which is a bereavement leave of five days, which I really applaud. Um, most of my employers, when I write a handbook, that's a standard policy that I, I have bereavement leave as a standard policy. But California is the first state to mandate it. Um, and I have had a few small employers say, well, I give sick or I give uh, personal or I give vacation days if people need it for bereavement. Um, but I, I applaud the, the mandate of bereavement leave. I think that that, that is, is really nice um, to give. But again, um, there's parameters around that as well. Um, so I, lots I, of leave laws. 
And I, 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 what my encouragement to employers here is yeah, uh, increasingly be, because the labor market's so tight, um, just to be able to attract employees, uh, employers are offering more generous leave packages anyway. That's just happening, right? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, more more paid time off, uh, a, a trend towards instead of sick time versus this time versus that time, it's just PTO, use it as you see fit, and then bigger buckets. So while that's a trend, you might think, okay, well, I have this generous policy already, um, no, no issues, I don't have to sweat the handbook details, um, but there are there are overlapping and sequential use of leave types that absolutely could impact you. So you might think, oh, I offer four weeks, right? I offer, I offer 20 days of PTO, use it however you want. Uh, but then they just took a, a week, a f- five days of bereavement. They took uh, X number of days of this. And I just am assuming that that's coming off of my PTO, but you might actually be on the hook to pay all of it and your employee could be out for a quarter of a year paid. Right. And, and I'm not trying That's to be right. inhumane to employees and their needs, no, but no. if you're a small yeah. business owner trying to survive on a 2% margin business, that one thing could put you under. Right. So yeah. you have to do this, right. You have to have the handbooks that research the laws, know what can be overlapped, what is sequential and how does that interplay with your current policies And based on the law, you might have to change your current policies, right? Right, absolutely. And and let's look at it from the positive side. A lot of times I'll talk to small employers that are family run and they're like, Mary, I don't need HR. I'm good. We're a family business. We're all family here. And, and, you know, other employers will say to me, my employees are all happy. I I don't really have employee relations issues. And, And what I'll say to them is, but you might not know about some of these leave laws that your employees are eligible for. And some of these are partially paid through insurance that the employee pays into. And some of these leave laws are partially paid through, you know, other insurances, right? So it's not all out of the employer's pocket. And shouldn't your employees that you respect and you want engaged and you want to stay with you, know about the leaves that that they can take right and they wouldn't know that because as an employer you don't have the time to look into this stuff that's why we're we're here to help you know and that's why yeah. you know it's you can't google what you don't know <laughs> and i love it, google too it, it, i'm it, not it, cutting on google <laughs> and you and i have talked many times i mean employee relation what's the what's the phrase uh peter drucker uh culture uh, beats strategy anytime, right? Um, yep, yep. A great culture, you, if you're, now we, we never want anybody to be out of compliance, but if you're, right. if you're not compliant and you have a great relationship with your employees, it's far less likely they're gonna sue you, or they're gonna come after you because you're probably just gonna be able to work it through. That's all, that's all true. Right. But the, the family culture that you may have had may, may have been established based on decades, though, the world has changed a bunch in less than a decade. This last two, three, four, I mean, there was a pandemic and the number of HR laws that changed simply as a result of the pandemic, the way the labor shortage is no longer some, you know, theoretical uh, big company thing, but the, the war for talent hitting Main Street, small businesses can't get enough people to even fill the jobs. Yeah. The game's changed. It just, it simply has. And you might not yeah. feel it yet, but all it takes is that one employee who you think you've got the great relationship and there was no issue with, with your, with your PTO policy until all of a sudden this law just passed three months ago that you don't know about, but your employee's spouse does. And they told your employee. And now all of a sudden they start getting this itching feeling that they're getting screwed a little bit and you don't know what's happening. You got to right. get ahead of it. Right. Because yeah, I mean, the, these things, you know, we had a recent <clears throat> employer join us, you know, great employer, so nice, Mike, that they had somebody who went out on leave. And by the time we entered, they're like, I'm like, well, what, what issues are you dealing with? And they're like, well, we let this person go out on a leave and we can't seem to get her back. And I go, well, what do you mean? What kind of leave? 
Why is she out? What has been documented? Well, nothing. She's been out, you know, two or three months. You know, we're really, you know, really positive culture. We really love our employees. I'm like, but wait a minute. She could have been, you didn't have to pay, give her full pay, number one, because she could have been covered by X leave within your state. Number two, you know, you got to put parameters around this because I think that's very nice that you let her out. But then when we started entering into it, Mike, this person was sitting on a beach someplace, right? So, you know, no good deed goes unpunished sometimes. Um, And the other thing is you might be doing that nice thing for that one employee, but then you have to do it for Mike and Scott and Mary and Joe and John. Right. You have to be consistent. Can you run a business and give everybody three months off full pay? I don't think so. So that's That's where these leaves help you that, okay, you have a situation employee. Let me look at the leaves that would apply to you. This is the leave you're on. It's for X amount of weeks. You need to check in these dates, give doctor's notes on, or, you know, some kind of, you know, uh, um, notation from a doctor or a professional, you know, for, for these particular leaves, you have to put parameters around these things so that you can operate your business. And so the employee knows to plan their time out. Okay. Next, next topic. Uh, there's, and I, and I, I think largely there's increasing clarifications, sometimes legislative, depending where you're at, uh, updates around FLSA, Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, specifically around definitions of independent contractors is, I, I think this is a, this is a confusing area for, for, for folks where I think a yeah. bunch of good intention people thinking, oh, because the job is X, Y, and Z, I'm just going to pay this one as a 1099 versus this one as a W-2. You don't get to make those choices. There are really clear rules <laughs> in play, yeah. right? Uh, uh, no, my, my, my favorite is the employer says to me, but Mary, they want to be an independent contractor. And I'm yeah. like, well, you have somebody else. True story. You have somebody else doing the same exact job that you have as an employee. How are you going to explain that to the Department of Labor? No, that that's probably not going to pass muster. So this gets very, it, the definition of an independent contract. Look, if I'm going to state it in super simple terms, um, an independent contractor has the control. So they have the majority of the control over what they do, when they do it, and how how they do the work, okay? That's simply stated the difference between an independent contractor and an employee, right? So remember from prior, you know, sessions that an employee under FLSA has to be exempt or non-exempt. We have no other choices there, right? The other worker that you could have in your business would be an independent contractor. Okay, so the laws around who's an independent contractor are governed by the Department of Labor and the IRS will get into it also. So you can find um, a fact sheet from the IRS um, and a definition from the FLSA, the Fair Labor Standards Act, on what an independent contractor is. Um, And it, it, it is, you know, difficult for a lot of employers. And I think what will help everybody understand this is, you know, the, the businesses that have really come to light in 2021, uh, really, and, you know, into last year is, you know, the gig workers, right? The, um, Uber drivers of the world, um, Mm -hmm. that were independent contractors, right? Um, but for our employers, I want you to understand a couple of things, right? So just like your employees do not decide whether they're exempt or non-exempt, it's based on their responsibilities. The independent contractor um, designation is decided by, again, who has the control? Do you as the employer or does the independent contractor have the control? Right. Right. 
So it, it, you, if you hire contract, if you hire somebody to remodel your kitchen, they bring the tools, they bring the expertise. You might work within an agreed upon time frame, but you don't you're not teaching them how to how to install cabinets, right? You're not you're not teaching them how to in in specifying the exact technique that they use to lay floor and floor tile. They they control the means of production. They have the tools. They have they they do it the way they they, they want according to their expertise. That's a that's a contractor. You hire an employee. You say no. You're going to use my hammer. You're going to use my nails, and you're you're going to do it in this way. That's a that's that that, that that's a uh, a carpenter that works for you as a W-2 employee, <laughs> right? I mean- it, Right, I, and you say, and you work nine to five. Yes, So, yes. If, And if I think a, a really good example of an independent contractor is that um, tech person who comes in and you say, I need a new, um, you know, LMS, a learning management system set up, you know, in the organization, you know, we think it's a three to six month project, do it. They use their own computer. They do it on their time. They do it remotely home. You don't give them a thing. You don't give them a pen, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Um, and then, and for many states, you have a contract. My suggestion is you have a contract with every single independent contractor, okay? Mandated in many states. But the movement that, you know, I just want to make everybody aware of is towards resulting in fewer workers, especially those gig workers being classified as independent contractors and being um, classified as employees instead for purposes of minimum wage and overtime. So that is what we see coming forward um, and what you know, is is now really being looked at. There's there's six core factors that they look at um, and they're similar to the old um, factors, but they're looking at totality of circumstances, analysis of economic reality. Again, that probably doesn't mean anything to you um, or to anybody listening, but it really bears uh, examination of looking at your independent contractors. You, you, the true definition of an independent contractor should probably not be working for you for 10 years, right? Unless they really fit into those parameters, um, an independent contractor is, is usually a shorter term. It can be long term, but, but you really need to be careful because they are scrutinizing this area. So Mary, there, there, so, so we've, and we've talked a little bit on this topic uh, in diff from different vantage points. Uh, or, or over the past several months, but what is the specific legal changes that people need to be aware of? And I think some there, there's some we're, we're awaiting some decisions from DOL still on on some interpretations. Yes. Yeah. So they were supposed to have a final <clears throat> rule in 2023, and <clears throat> now, of course, the 2023 is here. They're like, oh, well, maybe we won't have them in two till 2024, which is almost a full year from now. So it it has been back and forth so much um, in the past, I'd say two years now, a full two years, it's been back and forth. And it, it really, I think, comes from, you know, the rise of this gig economy, the, the Uber drivers, the, um, you know, the, the fast food delivery businesses and, you know, them, you know, raising the, the question, are we independent contractors or are we employees? Um, and so we hope that something comes out in yeah. 2023, but it, it is unclear. The Department of Labor has not given the final rule yet, and now they're leaving it open to push it into 2024. I think my, so. There, there are pending legislative changes. I shouldn't say legislative. There are uh, enforcement uh, pending enforcement changes here. Um, I would just encourage everybody, uh, all, all employers, to just <clears throat> you don't have a choice. The, 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 in many ways, the law has been clear for a very long time on this. I think uh, there's dare I say some sloppiness, and I'm not trying to be 
finger wagging at employers because Lord knows how hard it is to start and, and run a business, right? <clears throat> but you don't get to say whether a job is hourly versus uh, uh, exempt from overtime. There are rules that determine that. You don't get to say, oh, this person wants to be paid on a 1099. This person wants to be a W-2. I'm going to, to be uh, more flexible. For me, I'm going to pay this one as a 1099. There are rules that govern this. And as we, as we kind of migrate more and more from a traditional employment, uh, uh, W-2 employment uh, uh, economy into more and more, I wouldn't even say a gig economy. It's not like it's going from one to the other, but it's a hybrid, right? It's the person right. who is a W-2 during the day and they're a, a gig economy person by night, whether whether they're an Instacart shopper, an Uber driver, or uh, just an independent contractor in IT, right? Trying to start a new career for themselves. So uh, th these worlds are, are, are coming together and, and you've got to know the law. Anything else you want to Absolutely. add on uh, FLSA updates for uh, independent contractors? I just think it needs an examination by a professional if you have independent contractors, and I would make sure that you have some type of a contract with them. Th those are my my suggestions. Yeah, agree. Okay, yeah. Uh, we got two more topics I still want to plow through here. Um, yep. Number uh, the, the 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 first one here is uh, fair chance laws. I think let, let's start out. What the heck is a fair chance law? Where does it currently <laughs> apply? What's the trend here? Yeah. So um, again, when the <clears throat> fair chance laws are so that we give a fair chance to somebody with a uh, record, somebody who has um, a felony conviction, somebody who has been in prison, et cetera. And New York City was one of the first places that started it. Um, and I'm just going to tell you a quick story because I want employers to understand this. And, and, and I give this story when I do interviewing training because we should be interviewing individuals who are, um, are, are hiring people who are, uh, at, you know, good at the job, have the skills for the job. So I had an employer who had a stellar um, head of sales. Guy was great, you know, literally number two at the company, made the company really successful. Unfortunately, driving down the road one day, probably speeding because it was 25 mile an hour zone, um, not, you know, intoxicated, not on his phone, but a child ran between two cars mm. and tragedy occurred and the child was killed. And this individual went to jail for manslaughter. And when he came out, he had a hard time finding another job because that shows up if you yeah. do a background check. And that is what, and for many individuals, right? We cannot discriminate against an individual solely because they have a criminal history. Now, there are federal employers that cannot hire somebody with a federal uh, with a felony conviction. So, um, you know, that is is separate from what we're talking about here. Um, but the fair chance laws are set up so that we give individuals who have paid their debt to society, if we will, a fair chance at hiring. Um, Texas is new in 2022, and there are roughly 37 states and 150 cities who have adopted fair chance hiring laws. So what I will say to employers is that you need to look at the conviction, right? So if the conviction is for larceny and you're hiring them for your CFO position, then you most certainly um, can use that as a reason not to hire them. It is job related. But if we take the example that I gave and it it's manslaughter for um, the accident that, that this individual happened, um, then 
you really wouldn't be able to use that conviction against um, somebody who was head of sales, let's say, you know, for the positions that, that he was looking for. Now, I had an employer call me once and say, well, Mayor, I'm looking to hire somebody and they have a conviction for manslaughter for beating a guy to death in a bar fight. And he's in, you know, very active, um, you know, warehouse with lots of individuals. There's a lot of action. There's, you know, we've had fist yeah. fights before the guys get mad at each other. Right. And so that would need further discussion. So, you know, I'm making it sound black and white. It is not. This is something that I was going to. Really I was going to ask you something. I feel like this is maybe a, a conversation for our, with our friend Brian Schenker over at uh, Jackson yeah. Lewis. Uh, and this is one of the maddening things for, for me as an entrepreneur. And I think for other entrepreneurs in so many ways, HR compliance is black and white, you know, yeah. <clears throat> 1099 exempt, non-exempt. There, there are black and white rules that govern this stuff. Here's a black and white right. law, fair chance laws. Yeah. They're, they're di maybe nuanced by state, but th 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 it's written down as a law, <clears throat> but there's still gray area. There's still air yeah, area, right? Course. Like, like if somebody get in your example, <laughs> when you say a felon, we all, you, know, you and I did a webinar recently on, uh, on unconscious bias. Everybody got a picture in their head of what a felon looks like. Right. And it might, might be some right. shady character in a trench coat, uh, in the dark alley, um, right. they didn't picture the, the person that looks just like them in the mirror who, uh, it was charged for manslaughter for, for, for the, the that accident. Right. So, right. um, but, and so that's, an, that's like, Ooh, yeah, that shouldn't count. Fair chance law is great for that person. But what about the person in the bar fight? Is it fair to impugn their character based on that? And so that disqualifies them from any job. The, the, these, these things get gray. And it's just still, I'm always going to come back. The more you can tie things back to a job description and your policies in an employee handbook, and those job descriptions are tied to competencies that are written down. What are the competencies required to perform the job? That sets you up for success in all these other nuanced decisions, right? Around yeah. pay ranges, based on competencies and job descriptions, based on, okay, they did commit this crime. Is there a more obvious correlation because I have the job description written down or because I have this written in my handbook? All, it, you still have nuance, you still have gray area, but all these HR best practices help to make things more black and white and, and make, make your decisions more defensible. It, it, I don't yeah. think I'm overstating that, do you? No, and I, I think, you know, what comes up most often is DWI. I think it's DWI is the felony and DUI is not. Um, <clears throat> so I think that comes up more. There's also clean slate laws, um, which allows certain criminal histories to be expunged after a certain amount of time. So Arizona passed that um, and it's expanding to 19 more states. So you know, I think what I would say to employers about this, just to wrap this with a bow to use to use your your wording, Mike, is that I think, like you said, just reiterate to your managers that they should be uh, looking at experience. Um, and if there is criminal history, is it related to the job that they'll they'll be doing? Yeah. And I will something I'll, I, I say over and over. The war for talent is hit Main Street. I, I, I drive down my, my local neighborhood and there's help wanted signs everywhere because businesses can't get enough people to even run their business at full capacity. This is not going away. This is not simply the result of a pandemic or who's in the, who has con control of Congress or White House. These are mega trends that have been underway based on birth rates and workforce engagement rates for decades, right? This is this is not going away anytime soon. <clears throat> if you right. want to hire talented people and retain them, you have to expand your horizons for where you look for talent. And so if you right. have some personal biases that you think, well, I I don't like that law because, you know, we're a high moral virtue company and I you know, I care about if they have a criminal record. Well, 
maybe giving someone a second chance is great. And maybe the law that prevents you from seeing that in the first place is great because it just expanded your talent pool, right? All right, I'll get off my soapbox on that one. Let's let's talk about the last topic, I think, for today. Um, salary history bans. I don't think a lot of yeah, people so know what this is, but th this is this is an up and coming thing as well. It definitely is, and it's tied back to pay equity <clears throat> um, as well. Um, and basically just says that you are not allowed to ask the candidate you are interviewing for a job uh, what their pay history was. And the theory here is that if I make 80 cents to the dollar that you make, Mike, uh, which is what statistics will say, that I make 20% less than, than you if we have the same exact background and the same exact job, that if, if and let me just use those numbers, let's say I was making 80,000 um, and you were making 100,000. When you go to get the next job and I go to get the next job, you'll get 120 and I'll get 100 and I'll never catch up to you. Right. So right. Um, what the, in, listen, when this first came out, it, it came out first in New York and California, but it's now in 26 states. You know, my employers were calling me and going, what, Mary, no way I can't on an interview. I can't ask what they were making. And I said, honestly, why does it matter what they were making? You know what you're going to pay. And let's go back to pay transparency yeah. or you should know what you would pay for this position with this experience that you're looking for. Right. <clears throat> and, and this background, you should know what you're paying. So if they were underpaid in their prior job, why does that matter? Are you really going to pay if, if the job pays one hundred thousand? But the person you're interviewing, who is stellar and perfect for the job, was only making 70 at their last job. Are you really going to only pay, give them 80? I don't think so. Because now, you know, no matter who it is, it does create pay inequity, right? So, yeah. you know, you yeah. really want to try to <clears throat> you know, make sure that you're on top of this, you know, giving making sure your managers are not asking um, what the last their last salary was. And since it's in 26 states, um, my advice when I'm doing interview training is do not ask that question. The manager shouldn't be asking that question anyway, right? Because usually HR is making yeah. the offer. Um, but <coughs> I, I would <coughs> employees it becomes yeah. you know two what are you going to look up all 26 states every time you interview somebody if you're interviewing <clears> across <throat> right you know different right. states um so i'd be i'd be careful about that this, this yeah. is important i mean we, 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 we get the we get the impulse that how it might feel reasonable right so for you know for the right. three or five or whatever decades you've been in business and uh, you know, you want to treat people fairly, you want to give them a career path. And so you give them, you know, three to 5% raises and the high performers get up to 10% raises. And so you, 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 you kind of got this model that's been working for you for a long time. Um, <clears throat> but to, to your example, there are groups of people that can never catch up if everybody's playing in that same, same race. I've got a CEO friend. Um, uh, he's, he's got a great business on his hands, tech, uh, tech business. Um, but I think he's a brilliant employer employment strategist. Um, now th this doesn't work for all jobs. Some people, uh, geography matters if you're in retail and serving local customers. Uh, but as he hires engineers, this is how much he pays. And it's less than you would make, uh, market rate in San Francisco. Um, but you are in the 1% richest people in the world in, uh, uh, in Mumbai, right? Uh, and so he, he, all he cares about is the best talent across the world. So he hires engineers. It doesn't matter where you are. So could he pay less to get good engineers in different parts of the world? Well, of course he could, but he doesn't see, uh, 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 a worldwide workforce as offshoring and labor arbitrage. He sees it as He's opening himself up to the biggest talent pool possible. And this is how much 
this is how much I'm willing to pay to hire an engineer because this is how it fits into my my economic model. And if I can help some woman become the richest person in her town because she's an engineer that works for me, well, I'm just doing the world good and she's never going to leave me and she's going to be some, so dedicated to me. And I'm getting a huge win because I'm getting one of the best engineers literally in the world, right? Can I compete right. uh, in Silicon Valley? Hell no. Can I compete in New York, Dallas, Chicago? Probably not. But I'm still getting the best talent to make me the most successful company in the world. I think that's probably right. the way we should be thinking about what is the job worth? Open yourself up to the biggest talent pool possible and, and, and you win and the employer wins. Right, right. Right. Mary, I think I think we're going to call it a stopping point. So uh, we're going to pick this up. So we talked about the, the five major trends here uh, uh, in some very specific legislation that passed in 2022. So pay transparency, leave laws, FLSA updates around independent contractors, fair chance laws, and salary history bans. I think we you, you've identified 12 topics for 2023. Uh, that I think we're going to take uh, over a, a two-part series to unpack because there, there's a whole lot to go through that employers have to know. And this is a lot of stuff, but you, the, ignorance of the law is no excuse. You got to comply with the law. Uh, the the world is changing whether you like it or not. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna unpack all that information. And I think our next two shows uh, we're gonna split that off of those twelve topics into six each, something like that. Uh, but I think today was a great recap of the major legislative changes that happened in 2022. Anything you want to add to quote unquote, put a bow on it? Yeah, I think, I think the, the things you have to think about as employers is what do I do with this information? Right? So as I said, many of these, uh, regulations are going to have, um, a posting requirement, you're going to have to update your handbook. You're going to have to educate your managers and inform your staff if you haven't already enacted these, these laws. So that's what we're working on with employers. And like I said, some of these things, you might have to take a step back and do a couple of things like salary benchmarking and salary grades and, and things like that to prepare for these. So so take this information and and act upon it. This should be your 2023 goals. Yeah, very cool. I would love talking to you, Mary. I learned so much. And I'm sure everybody else watching today did as, as well. So until next week, when we begin our next two-part series on 2023 legislative com HR compliance updates, uh, have a great week. We'll talk to you all then. At Assure, we build human capital management software and services that help 90,000 companies like yours attract, develop, and retain great people. Our low upfront cost and affordable subscription model allow you to save cash to invest in things that drive growth, not overhead. To learn more about how Assure can help you claim up to $26,000 per employee with the Employee Retention Tax Credit, automate your payroll, and build productive teams that are compliant with ever-changing HR laws, visit AssureSoftware.com.